Uh, yeah. Had a kind of program running okay. Right. Ministry of Finance. Oh, I mean, we've had people in and out. Okay, uh, Ministry of Finance. Go. Yeah. 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 I've got pillars in the middle of it, but so I can't even see because that's yellow. Um, but I know she's there and a long and a long shape. So my name's Nigel Ray, I'm um, Executive Director for the Asia Pacific Constituency at the IMF. Um, before that I spent Marty might say far too long. Uh, Marty would definitely have told me far too long working in the Australian Treasury. Um, so I uh, just wanted to thank uh, Graciela, Renee, and Tara A for putting on this amazing event, but B for uh, inviting me, which I appreciate very much. Marty Robinson from the Australian Treasury in here in Washington DC, in a job that I once had, so I'm a very jealous of him. Um, uh, we'll speak later on about Marty's contribution to the Australian Treasury, and I don't, don't want to steal his thunder. So I thought what I'd do is just a couple of personal observations. The first is that I met Marty pretty close to 20 years ago at a children's birthday party. It was one of those Canberra, anyone who's been to Canberra, it was one of those outdoor Canberra events. Uh, and... Um, it was Marty who I'd only just met who drew my and my partner's attention to the fact that our two young sons were behaving somewhat unsociably involving some wildlife, um, which was much to our embarrassment at the time. Marty had the decency never ever to raise it with me again. Um, and I worked with Marty off and on over about 20 years. Uh, when some of us got together last night, some of you were talking about Marty's uh, sort of tour of the Northern Hemisphere in her sabbatical in 2018. Um, at the time, Marty was uh, the academic consultant to the team in the Australian Treasury that was building a new macroeconometric model. And her dedication to the, both the project and the team was extraordinary. And while she was on that sabbatical, she would dial in uh, uh, by phone, but also by video, to whole day meetings in Australia all through the night um, uh, and would engage probably even more intensively from wherever she was in North America, at Cambridge or in France with the team that she did when she was in Hobart. But um, it was just extraordinary. And it goes to her dedication to rigor, to fit for purpose, and to practical application of both economics and econometrics to public policy. And that was really where she was. She worked with us for about 20, not on this particular project, it would take 20 years. Um, uh, or if you give a model of 20 years to do something, they will take that long. <laughs> Um, but she, she uh, worked with the department for about 20 years. And um, uh, she's someone who uh, we miss extraordinarily in the public policy firmament. The other thing um, that Marty managed to do, uh, those of you who know Adrian Pagan may understand this, was that she managed to make Adrian Pagan seem a little bit less scary to some of the members of the Treasury staff. And that actually is well-being enhancing for everybody in Australia because it meant that they were much more willing to go to him and he would cut through their problems uh, uh, very, very quickly. So uh, that's a couple of reflections on Marty. My, um, uh, main task is to introduce Hashem, who is better known to you than to me. Uh, and he's probably going to talk about stuff I'm not going to understand, but that's okay because Tara is going to keep him to time. Uh, Hashem Pasaran is the John Elliott Distinguished Chair in Economics at USC and Director of uh, the Center for Applied Financial Economics at USC, Dornsife. 
He's also Emeritus Professor of Economics at Cambridge and a fellow at Trinity College. Previously, he was the head of the Economic Research Department of the Central Bank of Iran, the Under Secretary of the Ministry of Education in Iran, and Professor of Economics at UCLA. He's a fellow of the British Academy, the Econometric Society, the, uh, the Journal of Econometrics, and the International Association for Applied Econometrics. Uh, he was the he has an honorary doctorate from Salford, Goethe, Maastricht, and Prague. He's published more than two hundred publications. Do anything else? No. He's published more than 200 publications in the areas of econometrics, empirical finance, macroeconomics, and the Iranian economy. His most recent book, Time Series and Panel Data Econometrics, was published by the Oxford University Press in 2015. So, Hashem. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. But what I want to say uh, first before going to a technical thing, which I hope you understand, <laughs> uh, is that uh, I, have, I was unfortunate enough uh, to be a sort of a mentor, I should say, or a teacher uh, to Mardi. And I'm too old uh, to have been her student. And I haven't been fortunate either to have a co-author paper. I, I have a lot of, I mean, we saw that uh, Mardi is a co-author 76, something like that, you said. I'm also co-author with many. So the fact that uh, there is no co-authorship with her is also my loss. We were talk talking about last time I saw her before her unfortunate uh, and very sudden death it was when she was sitting with me in Cambridge, uh, as usual, uh, in, after a nice lunch, sitting in Trinity rooms, which I keep still, believe it or not. And uh, she, what attracted me to her was her enthusiasm. You know, the people say I'm enthusiastic, but I think she's sort of a power two. Uh, uh, enthusiastic. And it just shows for the people who shared experience with her. And we all uh, go travel, visitors come to our university, present seminars, we meet many, many people. And I talked about it, what is so special about uh, Mardi, which I didn't teach, wasn't taught by her, we didn't have any co-pay it. In fact, this is her ability to uh, actually come up with ideas and be enthusiastic about it. A lot of people have ideas, oh, it's too difficult, let's leave it, let's do something else. She wasn't like that. And I think that's what I remember her uh, stand out quite clearly in my mind. And uh, to me, is a personally a great loss, apart from the fact she's a loss to the profession, both Australia and obviously Hobart, where we visited with my wife. My wife actually told me last night, make sure you say how much we enjoyed her hospitality. <laughs> we went on the bushwalk. The weather was a little bit better, not that much. <laughs> and we also went for a hike. Uh, this picture was taken while we went on the hike uh, as well. So uh, uh, with further ado, now I said my piece, now I go to the easier task <laughs> to present the paper. So this paper, I, I said, obviously there are technical issues with it, but I'm trying to do today is actually uh, tell you why I'm working in this area and why is this important. This is, and then why it become relevant to you guys? Why is it, you should be listening to me. And I think uh, it, it comes from the fact that uh, we talk about risk, we talk about common shocks, uh, we talk about the way the effect of risk on commonalities are heterogeneous across companies, across firms, across countries. And this actually become an issue uh, in not only in uh, economics but finance as well for a long time. And I now say political science, sociology, the issue of how you discuss about left behind, how do you identify and how do you measure these things? This is really a, a wide-ranging set of problems are affected by the methodology that we use. Uh, 
Okay. So what is this methodology? Is everybody knows it's a factor model. It's a sort of hoteling when it's trying to measure uh, basically psychological characteristics, which are multifaceted. And hoteling basically didn't have many features, but nevertheless had enough that they needed to uh, reduce it into one dimension. So hoteling started with the idea. And the question is also, is the factors may be observed or unobserved? So for example, global growth, uh, GDP, you can observe it. But for example, if you talk about uh, general risk without saying what it is, it's kind of like unobserved. But you can then talk about both observed and unobserved factors. And there are many of them. Uh, and uh, last uh, 10 years, in particular, with the work of Bo and Meg and others, uh, many, I've just mentioned one name, one set of names, was Scott Watson, obviously many other people, uh, and also in, I should say, in Europe, uh, Marco Lippi and uh, Reichling, many, many people have contributed to that part of the literature. And the issue of the factors in finance, cap capital asset pricing model, uh, pricing theory, all of them are the same. But if you can also look at it, so they have factors either observed or unobserved, and they look at what is the effect of the factors uh, on the many units, and then what is the risk associated with those factors, and then how you price those factors, which we had the discussion of it early in the morning. All these issues are connected. Uh, for example, I come from Iran, and uh, Iran has been subject to uh, a lot of sanctions or 40 years, and when you actually uh, I was talking to somebody from IMF yesterday morning, they was, got to brief me about this thing. I said, look, if you run a regression of uh, Iranian output growth the last 40 years, we have a good data. It's better than Chinese. If you run that regression on the global factor, you get a zero loading. So Iran is isolated. But if you run the same regression on Turkey, you get two. It's over I ran it against Saudi Arabia is 0.4. It, all of them are reacting in different ways. So there is this heterogeneity. And the policies we use affect these loadings, okay? So it's the loadings which are actually of interest, not the factor itself. Uh, so that's what the uh, story is about, okay? Look, as the pricing model is the same. So people lose the factor. They say, oh, it's a form of French factor. But what the key is, I'm going to tell you another one, is how those form of French are graph for everybody else, right? Uh, so basically, that's the story of the loadings not the factors, okay? Of course, if you don't have a factor, you can't talk about loadings. So I'm not suggesting that you can do one without the other. That is why whether it's observed or unobserved. Uh, so if you now move to, uh, as I said, there is also issue of recent literature about networking uh, and also how to con conduct network uh, One of the topics I talked with Mardi, that's why he, her name here with one of the co-authors co sitting there, Wilco, and uh, it also came out because she was talking to me about it and I said to her about how you can measure the imports of the units inside a network, which is the work of Asimoglu. So I came up with the idea, which I actually presented it in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Mona, in uh, not Mona, in Monash, or a conference in honor of uh, King. Uh, and that was also discussed as another way of measuring the imports of units. And if you think about it, when you say some unit is important, it means a unit which affects everybody more than anybody else, right? So therefore, it's all to do with effect of a particular unit on everybody. So whether it's a factor, whether it's a network, whether it's observed or non-observed, at the end of the day, it's pervasiveness of the factor which matters. How pervasive it is. By the word pervasive was used by Ross as well. When I went and looked at this, because when he was developing asset pricing theory, he had to distinguish between factors which are pervasive and factors which are residual and unimportant. So you can get rid of them in a, in a pricing error. Basically, he called them pricing error. We have another paper which, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but it formalizes this, uh, uh, these ideas. We also discuss the issue of what about if you don't have a network structure and you want to find out the, who is important. That's become more difficult because you don't observe any network, you only observe correlation. And everybody knows there's a causal issue. How do you go from co correlation to causal, right? So that's another problem. I'm not going to address any of this issue. I'm going to talk a very simple problem. So uh, I'm going to say, okay, let's start with a single factor. 
Anybody should understand that, <laughs> okay? If not, they shouldn't be in this room. Okay, so you have a single factor, F, and uh, the xit is the measure we have on the unit i at time t. Think of it return, security i at time t. Think of F, the market factor, become capital at precise one. Uh, you can think of it uh, output growth, and F being uh, technological, this is something which Dennis was talking about effectively, you can write it down. I could be, one could be US, two could be China. Let's ignore the rest, but I'm not going to ignore the rest. <laughs> and I'm going to have the factor which could contribute to them. Everybody knows this model. Now, in this model, basically, one of the issues are, in the literature, when they model this, they focus on estimating the factor. Because their focus is on how to estimate the factor when the factor is not observed. Okay, that's one of the objects. And when they try to do it, this is what and Nick uh, have done, uh, if n become very large, you can show, you can estimate f point-wise consistently. You know, at every point at time t, you can estimate it under certain condition. And it's not surprising uh, that the sum of gamma i squared, which is the sum of the loadings, so in other words, you take each loading up, square it up, up together, you find that that has to ri rise at the rate of n, for you to be able to identify the, the, the factors uh, reasonably well at some rate. Of course, if the rate at which the sum of gamma squared rises with n slower than n, it slows down convergence. If it goes, it's a, a stable, it doesn't at all change, you can't estimate anything. There's no consistency. So basically, what we realize that the rate at which is some of uh, this norm, let's call it the norm on the loading, if you like, you can have the absolute value of a gamma, you can have a square of it, you can do many other norms. Basically, the norm of the loadings should basically rise with n. Basically, what it means that every time you add another unit, that unit gets affected by the fact, somehow. It doesn't mean all of them, but there should be enough. We can talk about what do you mean by all anyway, when n go to infinity, what do you mean? So that's we're going to formalize it. So, so the, in the literature, they typically have assumed, without any evidence, that alpha, the loading, this rate is one. In other words, the rate at which is of order n. Not little o, o, capital O use, because capital says up to. It should be at the rate of. So we invent which we put an O and you put dagger in it, right? So therefore, uh, you'll see that. So basically, the, the, then the, you have to assert yourself, it's not alpha, one, what is it? We can show that you can only identify it if it is larger than half. And if it is between half and one, then it gives you the different degree of pervasiveness, okay? So the aim of this paper is how you estimate alpha. That's a very simple idea. So basically, you're always assuming, you guys are always assuming alpha is one, right? Uh, if you look at the literature, and uh, this is assumption B in Barnack. <laughs> it's all, uh, I said the same assumption. By the way, I noticed it's written a number of papers, it's always assumption B, okay? So uh, they basically, the way they do it, they don't debate it, they don't say why they make this assumption. This is the fundamental assumption made. And my interest was that how do I know alpha is one? The factor. It's like chicken and egg problem. Uh, if I don't know what the factor is, I need to assume alpha. I want to identify it strongly enough. And even there is an issue of identification of more than one factor, and this may have one factor. So this is the issue I'm going to talk about. How do we uh, really address this? And also it's related to uh, finance. Basically, we showed the risk. The risk premium can be only identified if the factor is pervasive enough. And if the degree of pervasiveness is alpha, the rate, of the rate at which you can estimate the risk factor is n to the power minus alpha divided by two. So if alpha is one, which people assume, it is a good rate, it is a usual root n asymptotic. But if alpha is a half, it's n to the power one over four. I said to someone, do you know what n to the power one four means? And some econometricians say that's a convergence rate. It's like a log rate. <laughs> Okay. It's not very fast. <laughs> so basically, you need values of data points to identify risk. And we don't have that because we don't have enough market. Ross also pointed out 
uh, uh, role. We don't have enough securities, like a million securities to be able to identify weak factors. We just don't have it. So you have 3,000, and this is not always there. Some of them drop, some of them come in. So you have got this survivorship bias. When you add that together, it seems to me very difficult to identify risk factors where their alpha of the factor is not that far from one. It could be 0.9, it could be 0.85, but as you know, go towards half, forget it. Okay, so that's very important to know. You have now 400 factors. <laughs> People publishing papers after papers. All these 400 factors as strong as near one. So that's what I want to find out. You want to question even before I finish? It's okay. <laughs> it's just a simple clarifying question. It seems the first bullet point seems to associate alpha with a single factor or with a set of factors, whereas from your previous definition, alpha is a function of the whole set of factors that you No, have no, no. Compared. There, at the moment, I'm dealing with one factor. Oh, you're dealing with one factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to that. We come back to this again, right? But the good question you ask, because the single factor, F is one factor. Gamma i is just a loading of that single factor. But there are n securities, because you know finance, right? So n securities, basically. Uh, a thousand securities. Okay. We come to multiple factor. But if you don't, don't understand the single factor, I mean, if I'm going to lose, you maybe go to multiple factor. So it's easier. <laughs> so basically, this is related to the literature of finance, that you need the alpha to be one, uh, or near one, for it to be identifiable for reasonable number of securities that we have. By the way, people are started becoming aware of this issue, but they basically assume that uh, they, can, they look at the case where uh, alpha uh, less than a half, but as we are going to argue, basically that's like a pricing, or you can put it in the error part, doesn't make a difference. In other words, the fact is so weak, you can absorb them in the error term, call them error really in practice. So let me now, what we propose then? We propose a method to estimate alpha, First, when factors are observed, then we do multiple factor, then we say, what about the factors that are not observed? What about the multiple of them? So there are four possibilities, right? Let's deal with the single factor one, back. Now we want to estimate it. What is the basic idea? The basic idea is very simple. If, if the factor is observed, so what is the observed factor? Like, think of global economy, look at uh, XIT output growth. And think of F is a world GDP growth rate, right? It's observed. You just run a regression, just a simple regression, and you just find out how many of these gamma R's are non-zero. Now, the problem is, as N become large, we have a problem of multiple testing, right? Anybody knows that as you increase the number of tests you make, there is always a chance that you reject some of them, but you shouldn't have, right? So then we need to devise a complicated mathematics here, but become not complicated for us anymore because I've been doing it for a number of times in different contexts and people become used to it. You have to deal with that and find out how you correct uh, for the multiple testing so that the, you don't mistakenly take a gamma being non-zero while it should be zero. It's very straightforward. If you want to be cautious about something, what do you do? You jack up the critical value, right? If, if somebody tells you, oh, you, you may be rejecting uh, something you shouldn't have, it means your critical value is low. Of course, there is the other way around. If I choose too high a critical value, I may end up rejecting a lot, not rejecting a lot of them, but I should have. So then you need to do a lot of mathematical theorizing, using probability calculus, to make sure that the, you choose the right amount of jacking up. I'm going to talk about that as well. And you know the answer. And we have the proofs. And we have the Monte Carlo just to convince people who don't know the proofs. <laughs> I usually do Monte Carlo uh, not for myself anymore, because I know if I've done the theory, right, Monte Carlo should work, right? Under the same setting. But it's good to have it anyway. That's so, okay. Now, instead of using sum of a squared, I use absolute value. It's often more astringent in some way, but it's easy mathematically to deal with. So what we do, we say, okay, what is alpha now? Alpha now, we measure it as the number of units where the absolute of gamma i is strictly above zero, C. 
Now, we talked about weak burden. <laughs> you could make a C to go to zero at a rate, it still works, right? Let's not worry about that, okay? Let's assume C is fixed. And, and you go I from one to n to power alpha, and then you say from the onward the rest are zero. Now you may say, well, it's not exactly zero, but suppose it's exponentially decaying, it still works. Because if something exponentially decaying, the rest will become absolute cyber. So therefore, it's issue whether which part of the sum uh, of the alpha, uh, gamma i is absolute somewhere, in other words, they don't rise with n, and which part of it rises with n, effectively. So that's why we have that. So basically, we can now convert the number, the proportion of the time that gamma is non-zero into alpha. <coughs> I can now write down a mapping between a proportion and an alpha. So what is the estimator? I'll come back to that. The estimator basically, I haven't written it here, the estimator basically it is the, uh, uh, finding the proportion of the gammas which are significantly different from zero, take the log of that, divide by log of n plus one. So basically, if I know what proportion of the gammas are non-zero, I can get the alpha. <coughs> but the question is how many of them I know is significant, then I have to deal with multiple testing problem. So they have to, have to solve two problems at the same time. Okay, let me just now go and do the econometrics very quick. Okay, again, it's a single, it's a uh, econometric 101, right? I'm sorry to say, it's so simple. So what you do, you run OLS regression. Remember, at the moment, the factor is known, so you just have an F. From that, you calculate the T ratio of that gamma, the loadings. Uh, when you did that, I said, why well, everybody should be doing it? <laughs> it's obvious, because if you do a factor model, you, you are interested in loading, you need to look at the loadings. And then you basically look at the T ratio, and then you calculate the proportion of the factors which are loadings of which are significant, and you calculate alpha hat, which is basically one plus the, the log. And then this is the proportion, D indicator basically is an indicator which takes the value of one if the T ratio is above the critical value function, not the critical value, the critical value function, I explain in a minute. Uh, now, usually, probably we'll be using 1.96, right? If you use asymptotic normal, use 1.96. I'm going to tell you, don't use 1.96. Uh, use a little bit higher. By, by how much is given by this inverse of normal? Now, if, if I put delta, which is the parameter of critical value to zero, it's exactly what you do, we teach a student in 101, okay? So what we're going to show you, that what's interesting, to get the, the right, uh, the consistent estimator of alpha, which we don't know, you need to set delta slightly larger than zero if alpha is near one, but if delta is near half, you need larger delta. So therefore, this is a bit complication, right? Because the, the, the choice of the critical value function depends whether alpha near one or alpha near half. If it's below half, we cannot identify it. It's not estimatable, okay? So that, I'm explain that this is come from the mathematics. I can't really explain it. The only way I can tell you the following, imagine a factor is strong. It means all of the loadings are away from zero. If all of the loadings are away from zero, it means you have high power of identifying each of them. Therefore, you only need the critical value to be slightly larger than what it is, because all of them are going to be significant anyway. Right? If, if the true alpha is larger, is one, it means all of them are going to be significant. So therefore, you don't need to jack up the critical value that much. So the delta doesn't have to be very much. But when alpha, say, is 0.75, there is a proportionately a number which are really zero, and you want to make sure they are zero, and therefore you need to protect yourself against picking them up by jacking the critical value a bit higher. So therefore, you, what we found out, delta one-fourth or one-half is, is at best. So therefore, you could do cross-validation, you know. But you don't need to do it. You use delta about one-fourth, which, which basically cover you when it is one, which you don't need one, but then also cover you when you are away from one. What we found, that, that was the Monte Carlo as well helped us to understand this. So delta, you choose basically one over four. Now you have one over four, again we go back to that. If your n is, a, 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 say 10,000, 
one over four, it means you don't jack up the critical value that much, right? Because the nth power delta is not that much. So basically, but as n become larger and larger, you need to jack it higher and higher, but that's a log rate, basically. By the, by the way, this log rate also happens in all uh, uh, high dimensional statistics. It's, it's not unusual. Okay, so that is the basic idea. What we show then, we show under certain regularity condition that the probability of uh, selecting uh, alpha correctly, in other words, estimating alpha correctly, is goes to one, it's consistent. And what is amazing, that when alpha is one, the rate of convergence is exponential. You know, you are familiar with unit root tests and all of that, the co-integration is super consistent, which is instead of being root n, is n consistent. This is exponentially consistent. In other words, when you look at the, later on the Monte Carlo, you find that at one, everything becomes like a degenerate distribution, which is lucky. Because whenever you go to the boundary, usually you have a problem. Here, when you go to one, you don't have a problem. It's the easiest case to estimate. The error would be almost negligible. There's no distribution. In other words, it goes to its true value so fast exponentially, there is nothing to scale it back. Let me just now go through the, the result. So here the result. If alpha north is the true value is one, you always have a help with the log of n anyway, because it's always one over log of n consistent. But on the top of it, you get exponential, which is exponential of some constant t. That's what I mean. As t becomes, say, 100 or something like that, it just goes to zero. There's nothing left. Of course, if alpha north is less than one, then you have a distribution which is actually normal, but you need bios corrected, and we have got the formula here. Again, I don't want to go through this today. The, the paper is available. I'm going to, if anybody is interested, uh, I, I can send it. So basically what it means uh, that in this case, we can estimate alpha one, and it's less than one, but it would be uh, the convert, it would be distributed, there's a distribution, but only when alpha is strictly less than one. Remember, always alpha naught, which is the true value, always larger than half. Okay, always. So it lies between this. Now, so this is just summarizing the idea that uh, usually we really believe in practice that <laughs> The range of alpha, which is of interest, is between two thirds and one. So therefore, from mathematics of it, we'll see that one fourth is really the right area to choose. Uh, and Monte Carlo studies also support this. Now, what about multiple factors? Nothing <coughs> changes. Because I'm assuming multiple factors are observed. Remember, the number of factors are always finite. Uh, otherwise, the variance of xi blows up. So therefore, you have always a number of finite factors. So m is finite. You, now what you have, you have different alpha for different factors. This was extension is important because in finance there are many factors, the market factors, form of French factors, and many others, and we wanted to know how the, these different factors, I'm going to go to empirical section, what values they have. Uh, and then what you do, you just basically look at the loading of each factor. Now, going back to your question, you have gamma ij. i refers to the Security or individual, J refer to the particular factor. So you have this gamma matrix usually, which again, assumption B above, assume that, that the, the, if you put all these loadings into columns and create the matrix gamma, gamma prime gamma ma divided by N become a positive definite matrix. And that's exactly, is required that all of the factors have alpha one. If one of the factors of alpha less than one, the gamma gamma, the matrix becomes singular. And therefore, assumption of B, bar does not work. That is why also selection of the factor using bar neg method is very unreliable. Because it assumes you always have factors, number one, and all the factors are strong. But in real life, how do you know that you have all factors are strong? Therefore, when you apply to real life, Six factor. You put eight, it gives you eight factor. Our King Vanessa knows about it. <laughs> we have been doing it. It doesn't work. And the reason is we realize that the factors have different degree of strength. You'll see. And therefore, the assumption that they're all the same strength is wrong. Not to mention the assumption all one is doubly wrong. So that it could be possible one of them is one, right? But the other ones are less than one. So that's again go back to that. 
Okay, the rest of it is just goes for exactly the same. You just the t test. Now the factors could be correlated, by the way. I'm not assuming any orthogonality of the factors because it's observed data. I cannot orthogonalize it. Otherwise, I lose identification. But nevertheless, everything will go through. Again, you have the same proportions. The proportion you go. You have to ask. Obviously, factors are uh, have, they are not perfect correlated because you need to run a regression of x, i, on f, right? Any, any regression you need, the factors can't be perfect correlated. If they were perfect correlated, you should get rid of some of the factors and start again. So, but that's not the other. Uh, then what we need to, in now we need to make a stronger assumption about the tail probability. I think these are for technical convenience because very difficult to calculate uh, what's called the probability of uh, calculus of variation of the sums uh, without this, uh, basically assumption which requires that the tail probability is not, it says the tail doesn't, is not too thin. You need enough thickness. Sorry, tail has to be too thin enough. They, they should be too, too thick. In other words, the probability that uh, the value of x, I like a return, goes above certain value should exponentially fall. This is usual. Unfortunately, there is no uh, result I know which you can relax these things as such. Uh, but in my view, are technical. But when you make those assumptions, the fact that you have many factors doesn't make a difference. The distribution, if it is one, becomes uh, uh, what we call ultra consistent. When it is less than one, it's asymptotically normal. Uh, and that's the, the, the thing we talked about. But uh, it, uh, it is, uh, it, the, uh, the test, our test is in conservative because when you have many multiple tests, the, there are some technical, for some technical re reason, you can't really calculate the variance. You can only say that it doesn't go above certain value. Now, what about, so we come back to the application. So when the factor observed, when there are multiple, that's not a problem. <coughs> you basically you run an OLS regression, you just do a, a, a usual t-test, but you, ch you choose a different critical value. And then you just count, that's it. And for the distribution, obviously, you need to calculate some variance formula as well. What about factors are not observed? Right? There's a lot of problems in life that people do factor analysis but not observe. Now, the first thing you realize, if the factor is not observed, you can't say which factor which is not observed has, is a strong, which one is not. You have the fundamental identification problem, right? Uh, you, you can, however, you can say which one is the strongest. So, so what is the alpha of the strongest? I can say that, but I don't know which factor has that alpha. Because why? Because of rotation. Let me just go through the mathematics. It took me a bit, because when I was talking to my colleague, they said, oh, but uh, you do Chalosky, you can identify the factor using triangular method, right? But that doesn't identify the factor, it's identified the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues are, are unique, but not the factors, because you, you have the largest eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue is basically uh, has an associated eigenvector, but that eigenvector is not unique, you can rotate it. Okay, so let's just go through, see what happens now. So if I have a matrix of rotation to rotate the factors, suppose I've got two factors, because this can be demonstrated by only two is enough. If I've got two factors, F1 and F2, uh, and imagine both of them are larger than half, and imagine alpha one is larger than alpha two. Okay, so that, of course you could have any of them, but say the first one. We know from the, the theory of a principal component analysis, that each of the unobserved factors are linear combination of the principal component or eigenvectors, right? So whatever it is. But these Qs are not identified. Any matrix Q would do, okay? So then I can only estimate the unobserved factors up to a non-singular transformation. If that's the case, then you can go and do the analysis of the loadings of the, uh, the F1 and F2 the one I basically uh, identified, but not up to a singular transformation, then, the, then what happens, the loadings, which I've estimated, become also a transformation of the true loadings. So basically, very straightforward. When you have the factors are rotating them, you're also rotating the loadings. So you don't know what is the, what is the loadings got to do with which, which factor. 
But so that becomes uh, because then then you can easily see that the sum of gamma i one a squared of the loading of an estimated one, both of them are a function of n to power alpha one. So basically, it means uh, the, if I then lose a first principal component or second principal component, I get the same uh, uh, strength. So you cannot identify which factor is which. But it, you can find out what is the strength of the strongest factor, right? Because it's a very a bit odd, because you say, I don't know what factor it is, but remember the strongest one is lack of identification, but I can identify the load, the, 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 the strength of the strongest factor, okay? And then you can do, obviously, so it's the same as eigenvalues. You said the largest eigenvalue, the second largest eigenvalue. So therefore, if you know the rate at which the first eigenvalue rises with n, you can identify the alpha for the first eigenvalue. So therefore, you're really looking at eigenvalues, or uh, the, the way I'm going to discuss it, the, uh, the, the, strong, the strength of the strongest factor. So you can do either principal component, but you know, some of you know me, I like cross-section average, it's more robust, it works better. So here what we do, we just show that if you use a simple cross-section average uh, and you don't know the factors, so basically uh, you can uh, do exactly what we discussed before, I don't want to go into detail of it, just replace what you don't know by cross-section average. So basically that's what you do. And you go through the steps, you find that all the theory we have developed Holds except now that the second factor has to be the strength of it has to be enough lower uh, than uh, the, uh, the, 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 the second one. Let me just explain what I mean. This is the key for this bit. So basically, this condition has to hold. Notice here, alpha 2 is a smaller than alpha naught. Alpha naught is the, uh, the strength of the strongest factor, right? So by construction, alpha naught has to be larger than alpha two. Alpha two is the second strong, right? But the theory says that the difference between that should be negative enough such that root t multiplied by n to power, that negative should go to zero. In other words, t cannot be too large relative to n. So there is a balancing thing which comes out, which is not surprising because I don't observe the factors, right? And then I, I choose the, the strongest one. I have to get rid of the strongest one and find what is left. So therefore, it means that the second one has to be far away from that to be able to identify them from each other. So I'm not that optimistic that when you don't know the factors, you can actually do much. We did it because I'm, I'm sure any, if we didn't do it, people say, what happens if the facts were not uh, no. So I'm going to but do both application in, in these both, both cases. Okay. So then uh, what then we did in Monte Carlo. I don't I don't know. There's not much enough time to go. But what I'm going to show you what we did. Basically, we have two factors. We allowed the factors to be correlated or non-correlated. We had the AR coefficient of the factors to be either. Uh, Stereo correlated or not correlated, so you could do Gaussian or non-Gaussian. It doesn't matter really. In fact, we actually show you the one which are non-Gaussian and correlated. So we have a number of experiments, and then just for me, that uh, uh, this is an example where the factor, uh, the, basically the first factor, the only single factor, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, 0 0.951. And the reason we don't have any size here because it's a, a super, you know, it's ultra consistent. It's, it goes to true value. If you look at the numbers here for the subordinate score, it's all zero, even after matter by 100. Sometimes you have to matter by 10,000 for it not to be zero. In other words, it works so well that there is no error left when the alpha is one. Uh, and then this is what I was just trying to explain. When you when alpha is one, uh, it basically becomes uh, like an inverted V shape. There is no curvature on the top. Uh, so basically, it seems to work. So let me just go for the five minutes left. Uh, as I said, Monte Carlo is, seems to match everything we knew. Let me just now go and look at the uh, two applications very quickly. Uh, one is in uh, this area that we have 400 factors. We obviously, we're going to look at all the 400 factors. We're looking at 146 factors which was uh, suggested by a recent paper which came out Journal of Finance, they consider 146 factors. And we use this, there, the same data, we use 500 securities, but uh, the way we do it to not be subject to sample selection bias, 
at every the end of each month, uh, we look at uh, uh, all the securities were available over the last 120 months. So and we go forward. So therefore, the securities are not the same. But we end up with 442 securities, and we have 146 factors. The first factor is a market factor, which is uh, measured uh, like a Crips data file, and the additional uh, factors, 145 one, are from Feng et al., which is come out of journal finance. So they didn't talk about, they all used it, they use high dimensional statistics, just run regressions. So what we do, we just run this uh, asset pricing type regressions and just look at the loading of the factors. So th this is, th let me look at this graph first. The regression of each security as a rolling window. So, so each, each point is an alpha for that point, so it's a rolling window. And notice here that uh, the, this is a market factor. The market factor, almost one, except during the dot-com bubble, 2000, up to the financial crisis, of the financial crisis jumps to one. So there is this period that there is a deviation from market being always a song for everybody. It's like market disconnects. Imagine you have a bubble. A bubble is when some of the bitters become zero relative to the market, right? Bubble not for the whole market, but for individual part of the market. IT. But the, the reason why we have this blue line, the blue line would be just a simple cross-section average, right? The two really match. Basically, you could argue that the lowest the market is, is 0.97. So the, the strength of the market is something between 0 0.97, 0 0.96, and one. Pretty good. So the market is a strong factor for all practical purposes. Is there anything left <laughs> after the market? <laughs> okay, that's why everybody doing all this hedge fund thing, trying to find that new factor. That's why we have 400 of them. Now, this one, the, there are so many of them. So what we did, we then looked at the other uh, 145 factors, here what I'm showing to you is the proportion of the factors out of 145 where the alpha was po about 0.85, was about 0.9, and was about 0.95. Let's just start with 0.95. Is there any factor apart from the market factor which is strength about 0.95? No. <laughs> no. Please don't try to create more factors. Just have a look at it. Now, what about the number of them which are above 0.9? Yes, that's the blue line, 40%. But all of them, are during the financial crisis, from the dot-com bubble to the end of financial crisis. Not now. If you want to develop hedge fund now, the market become more efficient than, than you think. Now, I, this is actually amazing. I didn't know when I saw the data. We have looked 145. Okay, and we have done it. Every so basically, very quick, these are the numbers. Just one minute, I'd like to show you this. Then what we did, we said, let's do the uh, stock and Watson. Is there any strong factor in the US economy? Right, they are, what do they have? They have uh, something like about, uh, uh, how many uh, they, they, they have? They have, I think we had about, uh, okay, we have 120, uh, quarters, and we have 187 macroeconomic variables out of the 200. Some of them we couldn't use. So we wanted to know what is the factor in this. Remember when we applied it bar and egg, because they assume all the factors are strong, you get five, you get six. What do we get? We get only one factor, which is as strong is as much as 7.95. You know, it's very similar to the strength market, but it's not that great. You don't have to. Basically, the technique that we are developing is to complement what people are doing, not to replace it, number one. Because we say, if you do a factor analysis, please look at the loadings. Well, just look at the loadings. These are the ones who risk are to be estimated from. The second stage of uh, pharma market, those of you who do finance, is to use the loading and run the regression of the loading on uh, the, the, the basically what you are doing, but, but averaging. But the problem is, if the loading is a lot of them are zero, what is the regression you're running? It's like running regression on the excess, which a lot of them are zero. Of course, when you run a regression, you don't get exactly zero. You get some number, but you get, it's rubbish. It's all zero, but you think you're non-zero. You run the regression, you get something which is totally unreliable. 
So therefore, even if you want to do pharma magnet and other stages of analysis, you definitely need to look at the loadings before you move on to try to estimate risk premium as well. Sorry about that, that's I stop now. Thanks so much. Okay. I'm gonna go across the room this way. There's a roving mic. And I didn't understand some of it. <laughs> <laughs> that was my <laughs> Okay, it may be a stupid question, but there's something which is puzzling for me. We are in a fictitious world where the, the number of assets n goes to infinity. Okay? Factors now, the number of units. N is the number. N, the number of uh, securities. The way to think about it. The number of securities, yes. Now imagine that square root n of them have a non zero loading on a factor, but all the others have a zero loading on this factor. Okay? So, so you will say that this factor is weak because it's impacting only square root n, of, square root of the total number of securities. You calculate proportion. The point here is that the, the, if you think about it, the, uh, the, uh, the alpha is uh, basically 1 plus log of pi divided by log of n, right? Yes. So I didn't write it. But, uh, now, if, if the proportion are basically going to zero, right? If the proportion has to stay at some rate, the factor is still strong. No, but if it is square root n, the proportion is going to zero. No, no, no. No, the pointer is the proportion going to zero, but the, the, the pointer is that if you then look, you think about regression, right? Imagine you have excess. The betas is like x in a, a pricing of the risk, right? So if you run a regression, that what you need to look at all of the beta, some of the beta is squared, right? But if you want to say, okay, I dropped the one which was zero, it's like sample selection bias. Right? So basic, well, I mean, it is. So basically, if you have to include all of them, right? When you include all of them, then the sum of a square of these things, now obviously divided by become singular, and you cannot identify or estimate. So therefore, that's, that's weak. But if you say to me, no, I'm going to drop all of the ones which are zero, and I, I'm only looking at the ones which are non-zero, but then I say to myself, why did you bother the first one? Basically, how did you know? What's the cost of doing that? So basically, I think you decide what are the securities you want to consider in your universe. Within that universe, you have to agree with what I'm doing. Okay. But having agreed with the universe, you cannot renege. You say, oh, no, that wasn't my universe. That was my point. Fair enough. Okay, thanks, Hanshan, for a great talk. Two questions. One practical question. You know, one, one of the main purpose of uh, Star Watson is to use factors constructed for micro variables. Now, you identify there's only one common factor that is What's the impact here? Can we use the weak factors for forecasting purpose? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I wasn't suggesting that there is no market, there is no forecasting market value for this. I'm saying in one of the slides I did explain that if the alpha is the rate you're estimating this, right? The rate of, if you like, the convergence rate is n to power alpha minus alpha divided by two. Okay, if alpha is 0.95, it is not one, but still there, there is a lot of uh, action there, right? So, but if you become 0.7, in what sense, that's focused on how factors you have which are above it. Also, I have to correct. Maybe I misspoke. I wasn't saying that when you deal with the Stock and Watson data, we know the factor. The factor has 0.95. Now, it could be the second strongest factor would be 0.8, or it could be 0.92. I have not addressed that because the, uh, the factors are not observed. I cannot tell you what are the other factors are in a second Watson. Okay, uh, a follow up on Eric's question is, would the power of your test depend on the number of uh, zero factor loadings? Oh, in the sense that, I mean, so you basically, uh, the power of test is the sum of gamma s or square what? or epsilon. I'm not testing, I'm estimating alpha. <coughs> yes. But I mean, the test of alpha, yeah. As alpha gets, it's ultra consistent, right? So therefore, when alpha goes become less than one, become less than half, first and half become no power. 
whatsoever. The offer gets what the boundary five, the lower boundary, then you have a small part of the my point is offer is we be right seven quite such an offer. I make a long you have the number of needles on the top, you know, number of angels on top of a needle, right? The only thing which matters in economic analysis is those factors that are often near one. Doesn't mean to be exactly one, but it has to be somewhere between 0.95, in my view, something between 0.8 and 1 at best. Anything which below that, try calculate it. You find that the, uh, you got. the way to think about it, imagine when you run a regression in factor model, right? Imagine God gave you the gamma. Can't, right? Like that's what they do. They do two stage. They estimate gamma, they estimate F, then back and forth. Imagine God gave you the gamma. What is your convergence rate of FT? It's the sum of a square of gamma. So therefore, if the sum of a square of gamma, the universe you chose, <laughs> don't cheat. The universe you chose doesn't write with the N, your convergence is very slow. You cannot estimate FT. So basically, the rate of convergence of estimating point-wise FT would be n to power minus alpha divided by two. Okay. Even then, you know gamma. Okay. Other questions in the middle. Thank you. Uh, hi, I would like to ask you if you can repeat what you said about the bubble. When we have a bubble, something happens. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the bubble I'm talking about wasn't about the aggregate bubble, because a lot of economists talk about the bubble in the total financial market. I have come to conclusion for many years that is not going to help us, because you need a long period of the time to be able to identify such bubble. Oh, Peter <coughs> Phillips also worked on it and so on. But then by the time you figure out it has been a bubble, it's been in the past. Right? So the only way you can figure out the effect of a bubble to find out whether the fundamental of each asset, many securities you have in the market, is aligned with the market. Right? So therefore, imagine that is measured by the beta of that uh, security. During the time that this asset price is keep rising, but the market is basically, total market is stable, it means this asset price is not linking to the fundamental of the market. So therefore, I call it disconnect. The bit of zero, like a disconnect. If you count the number of bitters which are zero during period of financial crisis, you find, as you saw, the number goes up. The alpha coming down is like the number beta going up. So therefore, it is a mirror, and it's quite interesting that when you also run a test of market efficiency using the alpha test, it matches exactly this result. And I'm sure anybody would find it. So th this suggests that between 2000 and 2008, somehow there is a part of the market, not the whole of the market, part of the market was disconnecting. I don't know why, I don't know how, I have no explanation of that except some speculation. But I think it has happened. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. I'm going to push Tara. All right, you, if you ask nicely, Nigel, I'll let you ask him <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay. Just wanted to keep oh, people, people in chance. Coffee, I guess. Okay, <laughs> so, um, as a former forecaster, I actually have come to the conclusion you can't forecast, so, um, uh, and uh, now you've explained to me why. <laughs> nothing, nothing works. The, um, uh, the word you used to describe Marty uh, Hashem resonated in incredibly well with me, and that's enthusiasm. And I think we've just witnessed enthusiasm in a post-lunch session, which is always very difficult. And so um, I'd like to thank you personally, but I'll ask, ask everyone else to join me in thanking you for a terrific session with a lot of enthusiasm, which Marty would have been. Thank you Thanks very so much. much.